Happy Father's Day. God has called fathers to model themselves after Christ instead of modeling themselves after the kings and the fathers of this earthly world. While the world continues to show that earthly kings and fathers oppress, Paul in Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, argues that fathers have been called to act differently. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 reads as follows. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, throughout the years, and especially in some churches, this passage has often been interpreted incorrectly. Specifically, this passage has been often very controversial with regards to women's roles and how they are often been taught to be submissive to their husbands. However, instead of focusing on that today, instead I will attempt to shed some light on these issues by examining the context of this passage in light of the Greco-Roman context. First, let's take a look at the general context before and after our passage. In Ephesians 5, 3 through 20, Paul teaches proper ways to live under God's guidance, specifically living in light versus living in darkness. After our passage in Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, the text describes how children, slaves, and wives, how they should act and how fathers are meant to lead them in the ways of God. To see where the focus of this text is located, according to Paul, let's look at the actual physical size of each of these portions of text. From the very beginning, the very first verse here is prefaced by a capstone sentence. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. One sentence, good and short. The next three verses are specifically tailored towards women and how they are to function, specifically verses 22 through 24. However, there's an entire paragraph devoted specifically to men in verses 25 through 33. Now, just by looking at this passage, we can assume that a majority of the authors, uh, his focus and his attention is aimed at where he spends a majority of his time, specifically this larger paragraph geared towards men. You see here, Paul spends a majority of his time where the larger paragraph is aimed at men. For today, I'd like to focus on three key issues. Specifically, how the Greco-Roman understanding of kings and fathers impacted their roles within the world. Number two, how Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is understood and how it shifts the Greco-Roman understanding of kings and fathers. And number three, God and Christ's leadership as father or king of creation and how this impacts our understanding of how fathers are to act and how fathers are to lead. Right from the get-go, we need to understand that kings in the Greco-Roman context understood themselves to be fathers of the empire. So imagine yourself as a poor farmer living in the first century within the Greco-Roman empire. And here on this chart, you see that you live underneath this structure. Specifically at the very top, you have the emperor and the ruling class. And that consists of about 1% of the total population of the Greco-Roman empire. 
Underneath them, you have about 6 to 7% of the total population of the Greco-Roman Empire, consisting of retainers and lower government officials who deal with the day-to-day -day maintenance of the empire underneath the direct rule of the king. Now, the remaining 85 to 92% of the total population consists of farmers, laborers, slaves, craftsmen, fishermen, and basically everyone else who doesn't fall in the first two categories. Now, this 50 or 85 to 92% uh, percentage of the total population of the Greco Roman Empire live at what is called subsistence living. By subsistence living, I mean that they can just barely feed themselves or they are starving. Now, with regards to subsistence living, why they can only just barely feed themselves or why they are starving is because you are this poor farmer who has to grow and cultivate crops every year. And at the end of the year, you have to take what you have harvested and pay the empire their tax. Whatever is left, you have to collect enough grain so that way you can have crops for next year. And then finally, with whatever is left over, that is what has been given to you to eat and survive. Having said that, I'd like to address two individuals, specifically Alexander the Great and Octavian Augustus. You see here is a map of the empire underneath Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great lived or ruled around 300 to 330 BCE. You see in the upper left, that is Italy, in the lower right is India, and then in the middle there is Egypt. And you'll notice a small little red rectangle there, and that is Palestine. Now what's interesting about Alexander the Great is how he viewed the household and how he viewed his empire. And specifically when Alexander the Great came to power and he was looking for a way to model his empire after something, Alexander the Great looked to the family structure and decided that he was going to model his empire after the family. In the same way that the father is the head of the household, Alexander the Great believed that the king should be father or emperor of his empire. In the same way that the mother leads underneath the father, Alexander the Great believed that the lower government officials should rule underneath the empire to maintain order within his kingdom. And in the same way that children or slaves submit to their mother and their father, the lower people in society must look to the emperor and the retainers and the government officials and look to them for guidance and submit to them. That is the model of Alexander the Great. The next person I'd like to look to is Octavian Augustus. And here is a picture of his empire once again. Here in the middle you have Italy, and then you have Egypt in the, in the, the middle right there, and then once again you have the small little rectangle, and that is Palestine. And again, this large glowing area, that is the total land region of Octavian Augustus's empire. Also note that Octavian Augustus ruled between 27 BCE and 14 CE, or AD. Now, what's interesting about Octavian Augustus's understanding of his empire is that it's a direct reversal of Alexander the Great's understanding of the empire. You see, as Alexander the Great looked to the family structure and modeled his empire after the family, Augustus decided that he would look to the family and instead reverse it and say that the family should model themselves after the empire instead. And in the same way that the king rules with an iron fist, the father must maintain his household with unyielding strength. In the same way that the lower government officials maintain the empire, the mothers should look to these lower government officials and model their lives after these lower government officials when maintaining their household. And in the same way that the lower classes submit to and obey without question to those above them, children and slaves should look to everyone else and see that they must obey their father's leadership. You see, in this Greco-Roman model under Alexander and Augustus, wives, children, and slaves all had obligations to the husband or the father figure. However, note that the fathers, there was no law in place to say that the fathers had to reciprocate that care. And there was no obligation for those underneath their care that the father had to adhere to.
So wives and children and slaves were all primarily considered property of the father or the husband figure, and they had fairly limited rights as human beings, especially within the lower classes, because fathers did not have to reciprocate any care to those underneath him. You see, this model encouraged a system of household oppression that followed in the exact same footsteps of the various systems of oppression found within the Greco-Roman Empire. Now, when I talk about systems of oppression, I mean this, is that there are public displays of death within the Greco-Roman Empire. Public displays of death, we actually have one of a primary example in our New Testament, in the form of crucifixions. A crucifixion would take someone who rebelled against the empire and publicly crucify them and put them on display for others to say, hey, don't do this thing, otherwise you will end up just like this person. The Roman Colosseum is another example of a public display of death where it made death a commonplace in the everyday lives of the masses. Additionally, another example of systematic oppression in the public display of death is found in what's called the scorched earth policy. Now imagine you're an emperor and you're going on to your, your campaign of taking over other nations and you come across a nation and you say to them, submit to me or perish. So you have one of two options, submit or die. Now, if you chose to submit, that nation would then pay tribute to the empire. They would then be assimilated into the kingdom and the Greco-Roman empire would move on their way. However, if you choose to rebel, not only would the Greco-Roman Empire completely and utterly destroy you as a nation and then take you over, but they would leave your people in destitution and then when every other nation around was deciding whether or not they should obey or submit to or rebel against the Greco-Roman Empire, they could look to these, this destroyed nation and go, oh, maybe we shouldn't rebel because otherwise we will end up just like them. You see, Kings oppress and subjugate and conquer, and fathers were meant to follow the king's example by having complete control over their own households in the same way that the king has complete control over the kingdom in the Greco-Roman understanding. So what does Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 have to tell us? Is that Paul stands in direct opposition to this Greco-Roman model. However, Paul still uses this model to relate to his audience. That way they can still understand what he's talking about. You see, in Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, all of creation has been called to submit to Christ's leadership. As Christ leads, fathers must lead. As we the church submit to Christ, those entrusted to a father's care must obey the leader of the household. However, note this, is that leaders specifically husbands and fathers, must, they must love those placed under their care. Now this word must is a Greek imperative, meaning it is a Greek command. Paul is commanding them, these leaders, these husbands, these fathers, he is commanding them that they must love those placed under their care. It is not optional. Otherwise, the father or husband has broken the covenant of their leadership position bound within the covenant of marriage. We read in verse 29, quote, After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body, end quote. You see here, Paul instructs fathers and husbands to, quote, feed or to care for the family. And what's interesting, a fun little fact here, is that the fact that it's feeding and caring for the family is even mentioned in this passage could imply that some men in the early church may not actually be feeding and may not actually be caring for those placed under their care. So men within the church may actually be following the Greco-Roman model, and Paul is trying to correct it and try to get them to follow after Christ's model. You see, the men who neglect their leadership roles are comparable to the kings who oppress. However, Christ leads by caring for us, the body of Christ. So how does God or Christ care for creation and for the church? And I'd like to compare and contrast a little bit of the following Old Testament passages here. In Deuteronomy 1, 29 to 31, 
we read that God fights on behalf of Israel. We see this when God fights on behalf of Israel, when they are fleeing in the Exodus and they are fleeing from Egypt, and God causes the Red Sea to flow over the Egyptian people, for the Egyptian armies, and they have been saved. God fights on behalf of Israel as Israel is entering into the Promised Land and God clears out the Canaanites from before them. Additionally, God fights on behalf of Israel throughout the early history uh, of the kingship of Israel as they are fighting against the Philistine peoples. But who fights on behalf of earthly kings? You see, earthly kings make other people fight for them. In Psalm 68, 5 through 6, we read that God is the protector of orphans and widows. We see that God being a protector of orphans and widows with regards to Elijah and the widow and the orphan there, when Elijah provides flour and oil that continuously replenishes until the famine has come to an end. God is the protector of widows and orphans when it comes to the code of the kinsman redeemer. You see, when a woman, uh, her husband dies and she is left without an heir, the law of the kinsman redeemer allows for the kinsman redeemer to come and provide an heir for that woman. That way she is not left without an heir and is not left to be destitute. But how do kings care for widows and orphans? You see, earthly kings create widows and orphans through their oppressive leadership. You see, kings create orphans and widows by sending men off to fight their wars. Kings create orphans and widows through death and starvation, through subsistence living. Kings create orphans and widows through their wars and their cruelties and other acts of oppression. Finally, number three, Exodus 34, six through seven. God is mercy and displays courage, yet God still brings about justice. How do earthly kings act? You see, earthly kings allow for corruption to flourish in the form of bribes or corruption or unfair trials. Maybe we can look to Jesus' trial for an example of that. So why is all of this important? Why does this matter? This matters in a way that we have to ask the question, what is the gospel or what is the good news message? And to answer what is the gospel and what is the good news message, we must examine the single most important theme taught by Jesus Christ, and specifically the teachings found in Jesus' parables. To give you guys a bit of a hint, this theme is mentioned at least 108 times throughout the New Testament. Now, when you ask someone what is the gospel message, they often provide several different answers. And although a lot of these answers are very, very important and enlightening and helpful, they are not necessarily the main teaching of Jesus' parables and message. So when you do ask someone what is the gospel message, they may answer by saying that when you die, you go to heaven. And although that's good, Jesus doesn't really talk about this much when you actually read the words of Jesus. When you ask someone what is the gospel message, some people may answer, that it's the forgiveness of sins by Jesus' death on the cross. And although that is still very, very good, how could Jesus have taught about his death and his resurrection if he had not yet died and had not yet resurrected and he was still alive doing his earthly ministry? When you ask someone what is the gospel message, some people may answer that it's all about fire insurance from hell. And although that is definitely a benefit, that's not quite an accurate portrayal of what is called good news. It is not an accurate portrayal of the gospel message. So to try to understand what this good news or this gospel message is, I provide the following. The blank of blank is like a man sowing seed in a field. The blank of blank is like a mustard seed or a net cast wide. The blank of blank is like a treasure hidden in a field or a merchant seeking fine pearls. The blank of blank is like a landowner settling debts or a landowner hiring workers. The blank of blank is like a king preparing a wedding feast or virgins and lamps preparing 
for a wedding. Have you guessed it yet? The kingdom of God, or in Matthew's case, the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of God, the gospel, the good news is the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of God is a kingdom that stands apart and is fundamentally different from the empires of this world. You see, in the kingdom of God, God is the head, the father, the king, and we as created beings and as the church, we, li we live under his good rule. While earthly kings send other people to fight for them, God fights on our behalf. While earthly kings create widows and orphans, widows and orphans are taken care of by God in his kingdom. While earthly kings are susceptible to bribes and corruption, in the kingdom of God, God provides justice and does not let oppressive systems flourish. So imagine once again, you're a poor farmer hearing this message for the very first time. Hearing the good news of the kingdom of God has a much more immediate impact on your life now, especially when you're trying to grow enough food for the year. So when you hear the kingdom of God and it tells you a stories of 30, 60, or 100% crop yield, that is something to look forward to. You see, in the kingdom of God, you gain freedom from oppressive systems established by the powers of this world. In the kingdom of God, you live a life where God is ruler and oppression is no more. That is the good news of the gospel message. Freedom from the kingdoms of this earthly world. So what's the point? This text is not designed to subjugate women. This text is meant to stand as a corrective to men in powerful positions specifically kings and specifically fathers, who act wrongfully towards those placed under their care. Men and fathers have been called to model themselves after Christ's model, rather than the model of earthly kings. So to you men, I say this, remember that just as those placed under your care are called to respect, follow, obey us, we, as both men and members of the church, have been called to respect, follow, and obey Christ, so we should not mistreat those placed under our care.